I hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And it's closer now than it's ever been. I can almost hear the trumpet. And Gabriel sounds the call at the midnight cry. We'll be going home when Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children. The dead in Christ shall rise to me. I see prophecies fulfilling and signs of the time. They're appearing everywhere. I can almost hear the Father as he says, son, go get your children. At the midnight cry, the bride of Christ will rise when Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children. The dead in Christ shall rise. Midnight cry when Jesus comes again, and then those that remain will be quickly changed at the midnight. At the midnight cry, when Jesus comes again, when Jesus comes again. Gracious, Nathan Hubbard, look at him. Boy, you on the you on the stick now. We 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 have found you out. Um, good gracious, praise God. Um, Nathan's so quiet and then that what a voice, Amen. 
you know, I guess Sister Bess is going to be mad because uh, she had invited Nathan. To see. She knew something a lot of us didn't. Uh, and she uh, actually, I, I failed to mention that Lori, uh, her daughter Lori, had a very scary time this past week. Um, they actually thought Lori was having a stroke. Uh, she had stroke symptoms. She had paralysis. And the way I understand it, uh, not being uh, educated in medicine, is that there was uh, some type of uh, abscess behind her pharynx that was putting pressure on her spinal cord. And they were able to treat that, and they have, uh, have been able to, uh, to take her out of a dangerous condition. They'll be able to treat that. And so y'all keep Lori Williams uh, in your prayers, uh, and I know they would greatly appreciate uh, Sister Bess is way up there uh, this weekend. Uh, if you have your Bible with you this morning, I'd like to invite you to join me in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, I'm going to begin reading in verse 7 there in chapter 7 in just a few moments. Uh, but uh, if you will humor me uh, for a little while this morning, I, I want to give you a test. I, I really do. I, I want to give you a test. And you say, well, I didn't come to church to take a test. Well, this is one we all need to take. Uh, this is a test that we need to avail ourselves to on a regular basis. And it's called the prayer test. Uh, the prayer test. And, and life is really filled with all types of tests. Matter of fact, God uses tests, doesn't he? Amen. Uh, they use all types of tests to, to strengthen us and to grow our faith and to develop perseverance in us. And then we have all types of tests in life. And we're going to talk about those things and in just a moment, especially the prayer test. So if you're physically able this morning, uh, if you would please stand to honor the reading of the Word of God, I'm going to begin reading there in verse 7, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. There the Bible says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who acts receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. May God bless the reading and the preaching of his word. Thank you. You may be seated. I think most of us understand uh, that medical procedures or are, are, are medical uh, uh, Help finding out, diagnosing what might possibly be wrong with you, the malady that you're suffering from requires that you undergo tests. Now, none of us likes to hear our family doctor say, I'm going to refer you to a specialist for these tests, or I'm going to send you over to the hospital for tests. I remember years ago, uh, Right about the time that I was nearing that magical 40-year-old mark when everything goes south on you. Uh, I remember I went to, uh, I was going to turn over a new leaf. I was going to start seeing my doctor on a regular basis. And I went to see uh, Dr. Melvin Oakley. And some people here use Dr. Oakley. He's a good friend of many of ours. And uh, I remember Dr. Oakley was just going through the very uh, mundane things that doctors do that we've all been through where they look down your throat and make you say ah and then he took out that familiar thing the stethoscope and he began to listen to my heart and uh, I, I, he kind of listened for a long time and I finally said doc is there something wrong and he said these words I'll never forget something doesn't sound just right and, and, you know, automatically your mind begins to be racing, you know, well, oh, my goodness, I'm going to end up having bypass surgery and might have four or five bypasses done. Or, you know, you know the, the thing, most of those of you who have heard them words before, you know what I'm talking about. And he said, I'm going to send you over to the hospital, uh, and they're going to do some further tests to try to find out what might be going on. And to make a long story short, I went through these tests, and 
Uh, I felt a little better when the, the technician was looking and he said, you know, I, I, I can't tell you, I'm not the one that revealed the information to you, but he said, I don't see what he's looking for. So I felt a little better. And when I finally did return to see Dr. Oakley, he told me, he said, you know, what you have is a, a form of a heart murmur. And he said, you'd be surprised to hear that a large majority of individuals have some type of a heart murmur. Well, I felt a lot better about the situation, and that was the result of taking a test. Well, you know, if your doctor tells you, I want you to go in and have a test, any of us that have the ability, that have our, our right mind about us, are going to say, okay, doc, I'll do what you want me to do because it's, you know best for my health. Well, what if I told you this morning that you and I need to submit ourselves to some spiritual test, that we need to evaluate with the help of the Holy Spirit where we are in our walk of faith whether we are, are growing as we should be growing or whether we're stunted in our growth or if there is some type of very real spiritual malady that threatens our walk with the Lord. Well, you know, I, I believe that the prayer test is one of the best tests that we can take. Let me say just a few things about prayer this morning. A prayer is uh, much more than uh, what we make it out to be. First of all, prayer is much more than, be, than the mark of a devoted follower. I believe every one of us, if we love the Lord, if we're truly walking with the Lord like we ought to, prayer ought to be a natural outgrowth of our spiritual walk. It ought to be as natural as breathing air. It ought to be as natural as eating or drinking. It ought to be as natural as making friends. It ought to be as natural as loving your family. Prayer is the mark of a devoted follower. Now, we all understand that. We all know that it ought to be something that exudes from our life if we love the Lord. But oftentimes we struggle with just that. The thing that is most natural for a believer comes most difficult for us at times. And prayer is much more than the method of communicating with God. It's much more than that. You know, we often think, you know, if I'm going to talk to God and if I'm going to listen for God to talk to me, that is what we call prayer. But it's much more than that. Prayer is much more than the motive of aligning our will with God's will. You see, that's what prayer is really all about, isn't it? Prayer is not you telling God what you want to see happen. You can tell God that, but you know what God really wants? God wants for your will to be conformed to His will. I hope that's not a shock to you this morning. I hope that all of you understand that that's really what prayer is all about. That's why we pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're essentially saying, God, I want your will to be done in my life and in the lives of the people around me. I want heaven to be, heaven's will to be accomplished here on earth. And also prayer is much more than the means of God's power being revealed. It's the path, it is the means by which God has chosen to, to reveal his power. When his people pray, God responds by pouring out blessing. When his people pray, God responds by pouring out healing. When God's people pray, God responds by uh, unleashing heaven on earth. That's a great thing. If you want to see more people saved, if you want to see more miracles in your life, if you want greater spiritual energy than you've ever had before, then you need to pray. But it's much more than all these things. You know what prayer does? Prayer reveals the true spiritual condition of the believer. Prayer reveals the true spiritual condition of the believer. I, I believe more than anything else, friend, I believe more than anything else, prayer shows the walk that you have with God. It shows the, the, the inefficiencies that exist in your life. It shows the sins that are so often evident 
in our life, prayer reveals where you really stand with God. So this morning, uh, we're going to look at the various parts of our spiritual being. And we're going to, to let God test us and reveal to us. I believe this morning is after the first point, I believe that God is already going to be bringing conviction in some of our lives. And you uh, have the convenience of, uh, of doing it after I have because I know that as I worked on this message, God has already put his finger on some things in my life. And that's not fun. It's not always fun, but it's good for us. And so today, I want to show you, first of all, that asking God reveals my heart condition. Asking reveals heart condition. Heart condition. There's some of you here that may have likely had a real heart condition that required surgery. Might have required a procedure like having stents put in. But some of us here have had an actual heart condition. But today I want to talk about the heart with regard to your spiritual well-being. You see, the, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, that's a pretty convicting scripture. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, all of us have things that we're consumed with. Hopefully, we're more consumed with the things of God than we are the things of this world. It is the, the, the true condition of a believer that we would put the things of God first in our life. But you can tell a lot about your heart this morning by the things that you pray for. You can tell a lot about where you stand with the Lord, where your heart is, by what you're asking God for in prayer. Now, let me give you some, uh, some examples of that, some things that you can tell. Number one, who do I depend on? Who do I depend on, God or self? You know what prayerlessness reveals in your life? If you don't take time to pray, if prayer is not the, the majority activity in your life, but it is a minority activity, it will reveal that you trust more in yourself than you trust in God. The more time that I spend doing my own thing, coming up with my own plans and asking God to put his stamp of approval upon my plans, the more time that it's about me, myself, and I, the more it indicates that my dependence is upon myself, that I'm acting independently of God instead of depending upon him. Are y'all all right? Does that make sense? But I think most of the time, whenever we don't pray, it shows that we're behaving independently of God. Therefore, our heart is not really where it ought to be. How about this one? What do I want? What do I want? Do I want what God wants? Or do I want something for others? Or am I more concerned about what I want? Are y'all all right? I mean, think about it for a moment. Do you spend a lot of time asking God for things? Things that will benefit you? Do you spend a lot of time asking God for, uh, to, to bless your, uh, your, your, your financial situation? Do you spend time asking God to bless your health? Do you spend time asking God for things that you want in life? Or do you say, Lord, I want your will to be done. I'm concerned about the souls of the people around me. I want you to do this work in somebody else's life. But if, if your prayer is made up primarily of things about you, if the personal pronouns I and me are a large part of your prayer life, then it is an indication that you may be wanting more for self than you want the will of God or his work in somebody else's life. What do I depend on, God or self? What do I want? Do I want what God wants, what others need? Or am I worried about what I can get? And here's the third one to think about. What do I do? What do I do? 
Am I doing God's will primarily? Or am I investing my time in doing my own thing? Now, the activity that emanates from your prayer life will tell us a whole lot about you. It'll tell us a whole lot about me. Because prayer, I believe, when our heart is in it, it always results in movement. It always results in me going to where God is working. You know, so many times when people tell us about a need, so many times when people tell us something, we say, well, I'll pray for that situation. And we generally mean well. Amen? We tell those people we'll pray for them. And, and so we, we might lift up a prayer. Lord, pray that you bless so-and-so, that, Lord, you tend to this need that they have in their life. And that may be the extent of it. It didn't go any further than that. But I believe a large percentage of the time, if God leads you to pray for somebody, then God intends for you to be an active participant in the ministry to that individual. I really do. I think that's how God works. And so this morning, as we look at these questions, what is revealed through prayer about your heart condition? Are you thinking more about the things of God or are you more concerned about getting your will and your way? You know, a lot of us could start, we could stop right there and a lot of us would have to hit the altar already. Amen? Now he tells us in that scripture that we are to ask. He says that if we ask, we will receive. And it's more than asking one time. This is an active uh, voice in the Greek. That means that we not only ask one time, but we keep on asking. And if our heart is truly right with God, if our heart is concerned about the things of God, then we will keep on asking. And one of the primary indicators that our heart may not be right with God is when we can pray about something just once and forget about it. When we can pray about something just once and walk away from it. When we can ask for something just once, and it doesn't bother us anymore after that, that may, may mean that you and I have a very serious heart problem before God, and we need to do something about it. So asking reveals a heart condition. Number two, seeking reveals mental condition. Seeking reveals mental condition. Now, think about this all in terms of what a doctor does. Y'all know when you go to the doctor, he's going to, to check some internal things and he's going to check some outward things. Some things that are readily apparent from appearance and some things that are going to require in-depth testing to be able to find out. And that's what we're looking at this morning. And so the second thing is that the seeking part reveals our mental condition. Notice what he says in the text. Not only ask, and it will be given you, but seek, that is active again, keep on seeking. Seek and keep on doing it. Don't stop until you get the answer. Don't stop until you see results. Don't stop until God says to go in a different direction. So you keep on not only asking, but you keep on seeking. Jeremiah 29 and verse 13 says this. You'll seek me, and you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. Now, in this place, it's talking about when our mind is consumed, when our mind is stayed upon the things of God. So, what am I seeking this morning? What does my prayer life reveal about the things that I'm seeking after? Well, first of all, I'm going to ask you the question. What do I think about? What do you think about? That is, when you're sitting down and, and you're apart from the responsibilities of your work life, you're apart from the responsibilities of, uh, of a general activity, when you're sitting, or sitting around thinking, what are you thinking about? Are you thinking about the Super Bowl? Are you thinking about what's been going on in the press with Johnny Manziel? Or are you thinking about what your, uh, your friends are off doing somewhere? Are you concerned about your plans for the future? Or are you thinking about meditating upon the things of God? What are you thinking about this morning as you come here to worship? 
Are you thinking about what God wants for your life? Here's another question. What do I dream about? What do I dream about? Now, I'm not necessarily talking about what takes place in your mind at night. That'd be a scary thing if we all stood up and revealed the dreams that we had last night. And oftentimes, people, God does, I believe, work through dreams, but not always, do y'all understand me, not always do your dreams come from God. Because when you have some kind of weird dream, don't come to me and say, Preacher, what does that mean? First thing I'm going to ask you, what did you eat for supper last night? Because there's some things you eat that can mess your mind up, and I speak from experience. But what do you dream about? I mean, what are your goals and aspirations in life? I believe that if, you're, if your dreams and your goals are for the kingdom of God, for, for God's will to be promoted, if those are the things that you dream about, seeing people saved, seeing the ministry go forward, seeing the church grow, seeing individuals grow in their relationship, their personal walk with God, seeing your family members become all that God wants them to be, what do you dream about? Or is it worldly things? Do you dream about cars and boats and bank accounts? What do you dream about? What consumes your thoughts for the future? And, and friend, if it's not about the things of God, then it may reveal that your mind is not where it needs to be. It may reveal that you've got a worldly mind instead of a spiritual mind. So what do you think about? What do you dream about? But here's another one. What do I go about? What do you go about doing in life? Do you go about doing the things that you think about? Do you go about doing the things that you dream about? You always will. You hear me? You always will. Because if you're your mind is consumed with it so that you think about it all the time. If your mind is consumed that you have dreams about it, it becomes your vision for the future. It's going to block out everything else, and you're going to end up doing it. You're going to end up being involved in it because it is consuming to your mind. I'm going to tell you what. It's a good thing when you and I get consumed with the will of God. When we get consumed with the work of God, when we get consumed with the Word of God, and, and, and I'm going to tell you, when your mind is stayed upon the things of God, it's going to, 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 to make a great return in your life because you're going to start praying about things. You're going to start praying for God's will to be done. You, if you're thinking about God, you're going to be praying to God. If you're dreaming about God, then you're going to be praying to God. If you're, if, if you're consumed with God in your mind, then you are going to go about doing the things of God in your life. So, as you think about this issue of seeking this morning, looking for God, are you really looking for God as you should? Or are you looking for worldly things? What's well, another test we could stop right there? Give the invitation and we'd all probably have to get on our knees, bow our hearts before the Lord or hit the altar. Amen? Because we got to say, Lord, I don't always think about the things I need to be thinking about. A lot of us would be ashamed if our heart, our mind could be exposed right now before people. Amen? But here's the third thing. Knocking reveals physical condition. Knocking reveals physical condition. Notice what he says there in that verse. He told us first of all to ask. He told us secondly that we needed to seek. But he said thirdly to knock and it will be given to you. To knock and it will be given to you again. We have it in the active voice, which means that we not just knock one time, but we knock and we keep on knocking. Until God says enter, God says no, until uh, God shows us something else, we keep on knocking. You know what knocking shows? Now this is something active. You know, when I, I think about uh, asking and seeking, that seems to be more in, in my estimation of 
the, the fact that this is something that we do in prayer. This is something that we do with our hearts bowed or with our knees bowed. But then when I think about this knocking, this is actually pursuing with a determination the will of God. This is pressing forward. This is persevering. This is being determined to see God's will come through. Determined to see God's will get done. You know what the Bible says? If you keep on knocking, what's going to happen? What's the result? A door will be open. Now here's what usually happens if I come over to your house. It may not happen. I go and I knock on your door. And most of the time, you might look through the curtain, you might look through the peephole. Well, that's the preacher, go hide under the bed. No, nobody does that, hopefully. When, when, when you come, I come and knock on your door and, and you open the door. And when you open the door, generally what's that mean? I want you to come in. I want you to enter in. That's what an open door is. An open door is an invitation to enter into. And if it happens at my home, if I open the door, it's an invitation to enter in. But if I don't open the door, it means that you've got to stay out. So what the Bible says, that if I ask, if I seek, and if I knock, and I keep on knocking, and God opens up the door, that is an invitation by God for me to enter in. Enter into what? Enter into His will. Enter into His work. Enter into what He is actively doing in the world around me. That means that I just don't ask about it. It means that I just don't seek for His will to be done. But I become an active participant. Moving my prayer from the place of prayer to, to actively being a part of what God is involved in in my community. Think about it this way. Sick people are often immobile. You, you, you realize that. You know, when I'm sick, I usually go to bed. I, I usually, uh, I, I'm not a good patient, first of all. Best thing I can do is sleep it off. I go back there and I get in the bed and sleep and fluids and rest is what, what helps me get better. I am essentially immobile. I'm immobile. Until I begin to get well. But think about it this way also. Healthy people are active. Now I can tell this morning. Who's uh, by, by the activity of who is feeling good. I love to see the children moving around. I love to hear the children and they're active. That's an indication that they're healthy. Sometimes I look at us, uh, us adults and I wonder if we're healthy. Sick people are often immobile, but healthy people are active. And this morning, if you and I are spiritually healthy, if we are spiritually right with God, then our bodies are going to be active in participating in God's work. We're going to be entering in to the work that God has going. Those people that we pray for, you pray for a lost person, I can promise you that if God can put you in that person's path and you will submit yourself to be a part of that work, God, you don't need to really pray for God to send somebody to that person. God will send you. And when there's somebody that, that, that needs ministry, when you say, well, Lord, put so-and-so in their path so that they'll get the provision that they need, so that they'll get the funds that they need, so that they'll get the ministry that they need, if you pray about that, I can almost promise you that God will move you to be the one that will minister to them, to meet their needs. And if you've got it, to meet that, that financial difficulty that they face. God will move you from the place of prayer to be an active participant in the work that he's doing. How are we doing on the test so far? Are we healthy? Are we active? Or are we immobile? And are we failing the test of good spiritual health? See, prayer involves 
three basic things. It involves asking. That is, presenting our request to God. It involves alignment. That is, getting my will into line with God's will. But then it involves attending. It involves moving from the place of prayer to a very active type of prayer that puts me on the scene of where God is at work. I don't guess as long as I live, I'll never forget what Henry Blackaby taught in experiencing God. That God is always at work in the world around us and wants us to join Him in that work. And so if we're not asking that God's work be done, if we're not aligning ourselves with God's will, that needs to be done. And if we're not attending to the ministry that we've been praying about that needs to be done. Then we might be failing the test this morning. Say brother Jeff there's a lot of those things that you talked about this morning. That are not true of my life. And if I'm honest this morning I've been under deep conviction about a lot of the things that I hadn't been doing. You say well what in the world do I need to do preacher? What can I do? If I fail the test, what can I do to get better? Well, you know, every time you go to the doctor and he does tests, he's going to not, usually he's going to tell you, well, this test revealed that you have this problem, so I want you to undergo this procedure, or I want you to take this medicine. Well, this morning you say, preacher, I failed the test. There's a lot of things that are not right with me as I've taken the prayer test. What can I do? Well, friends, the first step is to go back to the very principles of prayer that Jesus taught. And that is to begin asking for God to help you to be everything. What did the disciples do? The disciples came to Jesus. They saw the prayer life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they came and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And often we think about, Lord, Give us a method. And and he even did that. He gave a method for prayer. They gave the model prayer. But more than that, I believe that these men were asking, Lord, we see how you pray. And we don't pray like that. We see how you beseech God. And we don't seek God like that. We want to be able to pray like you. We want to have a desire to seek the Father like you. And essentially what they are saying, Lord... Teach us to have the desire, the want to, to pray like that. This morning I need to come and I need to ask God to give me that kind of desire. And then I need to seek after Him. If you seek Him, what's He promised that He'll do? If you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. You'll arrive where God wants you to be. And then finally, if you knock That is, you submit your life to Him and you say, Lord, I want to be involved in what you're doing. I want to put feet on my prayer. Friends, I believe this morning that if you'll bring your life to God, your mind, your heart, your body, and say, Lord, I want to be the prayer warrior that you want me to be, I believe He'll hear that prayer and He will answer it. And so this morning, the invitation is simply this. If there's somebody here, It's never been saved. That is, they don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. During the invitation, I want to, I'll be standing right down front when the song begins to be played and sung. I'll be down here, and I want to invite you to come and say, Brother Jeff, I want a relationship with the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. I want to turn away from the sin that's in my life, and I want to, to trust in what Jesus did to pay for my sin, and I want Him to be the Lord of my life. Not only my Savior, but I want Him to be the one that calls the shots. I want to live my life for His honor and His glory. If you'll come this morning and just say, Brother Jeff, I want to be saved. I consider it a great privilege to be able to lead you to faith in Christ. Maybe this morning you need to come and join the life of this church family. Maybe you need to come and follow in believer's baptism. I want to invite you to do that. But here's the greater invitation this morning. I want to invite you to prayer. 
I want to invite you to commit yourself to asking the Lord, to, to, to seeking the Lord, to knocking on heaven's door. I want to ask you to commit yourself to that this morning. And one of the greatest indicators of that is if you physically come to the altar and say, Lord, I want you to know and I want men to see that I'm making a commitment to a life of prayer. To move onward and upward from the place where I am to the place that you want me to be. Father, have your will in your way in these moments that remain. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.